Greetings. Welcome to this lecture on cytokinesis, mitosis, and meiosis. In this lecture, we will be discussing the important elements of the process of cell replication as well as DNA replication. As an introduction, we have to understand the basis for the continuation of genetic material. In order to do this, we have to understand how cells store information, how they replicate information, how they divide by transmitting this information. We also have to understand the concept of ploidy and how it influences evolution, as well as the concept of alternation of generations. Now your learning outcomes for this particular lecture module are to describe the various kinds of cells by various kinds or various types. I mean the prokaryotic, eukaryotic, and within eukaryotic, the plant and animal cells. You have to describe the structure and organization of chromosomes. This is the hereditary material which carries information. Describe the process of mitosis, meiosis, and cytokinesis. And apply your knowledge of ploidy to develop strategies for the development of new plant varieties. We will be looking at some of the examples of plant varieties, which are triploid, tetraploid, hexaploid, and analyzing how this concept of ploidy or the manipulation of ploidy can be utilized for development of novel species. This is the overall content for this lecture. We will be looking at cell types, the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, the cell components, the components within the cell constitute organelles, as well as certain structural and functional elements. Then we look at plant cells, chromosomes, cytokinesis, the various phases in the cell cycle, mitosis, meiosis, and the alternation of generations with relation to plant cells and plants. Now, as you probably know, there are various kinds of cells from the prokaryotic to the eukaryotic. So we commence the discussion with a basic cell, which is the bacterial cell. And this cell, although it may appear to be very simple, is also a very complex mechanism because it undergoes multiple processes and executes multiple functions within the context of a single cell. Transitioning from prokaryotic to eukaryotic cells, we have the yeast. Yeast are single cells, but they have the structure of chromosomes. And because of this, they have more complex evolutionary processes and functional aspects. From yeast, we transition to the higher eukaryotes, which are the animal cells, which now are differentiated, and the plant cells, which are differentiated from animal cells by virtue of their cell wall. Now let's look at the very simple uh, prokaryotic cell. I would not like to call it simple because the simplicity is underscored by the level of um, processes which undergo, uh, which are taking place or this, which are undergoing in the cell. Let me pull out a whiteboard for your reference so that I can share this with you. Okay, so now we look at the various kinds of cells within the context of the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells with regard to the nuclear organization, as well as the structural and functional elements within the cell. Okay, so if you look at the cell in itself, we have the cell boundary. So the cell boundary is essentially a peripheral boundary, which is composed of different kinds of polysaccharides and lipid material based on the type of the cell. So among the prokaryotes, which is bacteria, you have the, you you have the uh, gram-positive and the gram-negative 
types of cell balls. OK, we also have the archaea, which we won't discuss in this lecture, but an archaea are more advanced in terms of their genetic processes. So we focus primarily on bacteria. So within a bacterial cell, we have the chromosome or the genetic material, as well as smaller genetic material in the form of plasmids. Now, if you look at a bacterial cell, you will notice that there is no nuclear membrane and the ribosomes will be bound directly to the RNA or the RNA which is being transcribed from the nucleus. Okay. So uh, the nuclear material. We also have plasmids which are small extra chromosomal vehicles. This can be shuttled or transmitted horizontally between species. And this concept of horizontal gene transfer is what makes bacteria very unique in terms of the ability to transfer genes between species, within species, as and also to plants. For example, Agrobacterium tumefaciens will transfer genetic material to the plant as well. So it's unique in that sense. Now, bacteria have got flagella for, mot uh, for motility. So some bacteria do not have flagella. So you have flagella here for motility. Some of them also have pili, which al allow them to share genetic material. So bacteria are very unique in the sense that they have adapted to life as a single cell. So they carry out all the processes of replication, cell division, as well as the bioenergetic process within a single cell. Let's move on to the concept of binary fission. Now, in the case of bacterial cells, division occurs by the process of binary fission, which means that you have a single cell and then you have the formation of a membrane here, and then the cells will divide into exactly the same daughter cells. So there'll be no change in terms of the chromosomal homologacy combination. Of course, there will be mutation if you subject the bacterium to certain environmental forces. However, there's each daughter cell. If there is no external stimuli, they will replicate as such, and this process is known as binary fission. Now, this is unique to bacteria and some yeast. So in among the yeast, we have the two types of yeast. Okay, we move on to the next one, which is the yeast. So among the yeast, we have the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the common baker's yeast. So this one will replicate by a process known as budding, or daughter cells will actually emerge from the mother cell. Okay, so you can imagine this as a mother cell and then the daughter cell will bud off from that and then it will grow into a full daughter cell. Of course, yeasts have processes uh, such as the formation of the spores, but we won't discuss that because this is primarily focusing on uh, plants. Then we have this uh, Schizosaccharomyces pombi, which is a different kind of yeast, which is a fission yeast. So this is one of the yeasts which actually undergoes fission, in which case you have the Similar processes, bacteria with the formation of two cells and the division in which both the daughter cells have the same material, genetic material. Moving on to the eukaryotic cells. Okay, eukaryotic cells are far more complex. So you have a membrane as such as the cell wall and so on and so forth. But you also have the nucleus, which is a membrane that encloses the genetic material. Now, within an animal cell, you will also have the mitochondrial genome. So if you are looking at the cell in terms of the understanding of genomics, we need to look at the genomes themselves. So I'm not going to discuss the other components of the cell because we are looking at it from the genetic perspective rather than from the structural perspective. So these are the two uh, divisions of the genetic material. And the mitochondrial genome is generally inherited maternally. Okay. And this one is inherited biparently, the nucleus and the chrom chromosomal material. Now, moving on to plant cells. Plant cells have three unique genomes. So you have a plant cell. So in, when we refer to plant cells, we generally use a cell wall to draw or sketch the plant cells when we doodle it. So we get some kind of perspective on the presence of cell wall. And there are small channels, plasmodesmata, which connect cells and through which you have the transmission of the biomolecules as well as water. And in some case, even virus as RNA. 
So in the case of plant cells, you'll have three genomes. One is the nuclear genome. Then we have the plastid genome, which is in the chloroplast, chromoplast, leucoplast. So they carry a small genome. And then you have the mitochondrial genome. And the presence of these genomes is very important when we study plant reproduction because some of the aberrant genomes in the organelles, which is the plastids, can lead to what is known as cytoplasmic male sterility. So this is something which you need to delve into as you study the plant cell biology. Okay, let's move on to the differences between plants and animal cells. So in plant cells, you will notice there's a very large vacuole here, and then you have the plastids, and you also have the nucleus, mitochondria, etc., dispersed through this. Now, the difference between plant and animal cells is the presence of the cell wall. This cell wall is composed of cellulose, lignin, and pectin, and other components as well, such as proteins. And this cell wall gives a certain amount of rigidity to the cell. And when it comes down to mitosis and meiosis, or the process of cytokinesis, this cell wall is actually separated using a special uh, mechanism, which is different from animal cells. We'll go into that as we progress through the lecture. Now, the organization of information in cells is based on chromosomes. Okay, let, let us look at the analogy. So in your computer, you have a hard drive, or now we have Usually we have the uh, called as solid state drives. There's no more mechanical drives. It's all a uh, chip based. So you'll have this drive and in this drive, you organize your information in the form of folders. Why do you have this organization of folders? It's simply because you can reference your material more easily or access your material more easily. Now, in the case of some, uh, most of us will have a backup file. So we'll back up all our folders. So in case the main folder is lost, we will have the backup folder. Now, when you look at chromosomes, the information which is contained in the cell is transmitted via chromosomes. So they are critical for the progress of the cell, which is why your chromosomes will have a duplicate. So you have a duplication of the genetic material. So in the event that one of the material gets, for example, compromised, there's a degradation or there is a misstep there will be always be a backup material. So chromosomes are nothing more than your organization of information in the cell. So they're organizing information based on the different kinds of genes which are encoded on the chromosomes. So now this is a uh, visual of a chromosome. And as you can see, these are the dense regions of the chromosome which have been identified by staining. This is one of the early pictures of the polyteen chromosomes. So look at chromosomes purely in terms of their ability to store information. Now, chromosomes are divided into two types. You have the autosomes, which code for genes uh, related to the structure and functions, as well as the sex chromosomes. So you are familiar with uh, the human X and Y chromosomes. So these are sex chromosomes. They encode the genes related to gender, as well as certain other essential genes. We also have haploid and diploid. So when we refer to haploid, we generally refer to 2N. You have the diploid and the haploid. So 2N is the diploid, and then you have the N, which is the haploid. You also have the triploid, tetraploid, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are the different designations or notations for chromosomes. Homologs actually refer to the chromosomes which are, can form pairs, which means that they will have a similar set of genes. And this genes may be in the form of alleles. So you'll have A here and you may have A here. So, but they are alleles of each other. So they pair together. Then you have karyotype packaging, which is done in histones, which I will delve into in the next lecture. So chromosomes are generally wrapped on what are known as histone proteins. Then we also have the designation of chromosomes as metacentric, submetacentric, acrocentric, and telocentric. So this is a meta. Meta means central. So everything will be dispensed uh, across this central area. So you have a centromere and then the distribution of the material here. Now, in the case of telocentric, telocentric chromosomes will look like this because you have a telomere. So there will be a very small, this will be the central part. So in the chromosomes, we generally refer to the first arm, which is the P as petite, which is small, and then Q. This is uh, um, 
not uh, actual designation. It's petite means small in French, and Q is the P and Q. But in the case of some chromosomes, this P arm may actually be large, and the Q arm may be proportionately smaller, but we still refer to it as P and Q. Now, when the genetic material is packaged in cells, it's actually stored in the form of a chromosome, but what we actually have is DNA. So you look at this in terms of the analogy will be your zip file. Whenever you want to store information, you will zip file or zip it and you will transmit it to your friend or your lecturer or so on and so forth. So the DNA is actually stored in the histones. Histones are then folded into the nucleosomes and then you have the chromatin and the chromosome. Okay, so this is the various stages. Now, as the cell divides, okay, these things unfold. And when the cell is uh, uh, already divided or past division in the post division phase, it opens up. Now, the reason why you do this is because during the process of division, you don't require the expression of the all the genes, whereas during the process of cellular function, almost all the genes have to function. So you have this process of division. Okay. Now, ploidy is very interesting. In fact, many of the plant crops are having different levels of ploidy. So wheat is actually hexaploid. It has six N, uh, two N is six. Then we have the sugarcane, octoploid, bananas, triploid, and potatoes are tetraploid. Okay, so you can see the diversity of crops because of the ploidy levels. Okay, so you can you, you look at the, for example, the solanaceous crops, they will have a diploid genome, but then potatoes are tetraploid. Let's move on to the concept of the cell cycle. Now, the process of cell division is cyclical. Okay, now the next question you will ask me when I say the cyclical is, is this cell cycle infinite? Now, we have to look at it from the perspective of human cell lines and plant cells. Now, human cells have what is known as a hayflick limit. They will only divide a certain number of times and then the cell cellular machinery will signal the cells to undergo apoptosis or program cell death. Because if the cell becomes infinitely dividing, there's a likelihood of the damage of chromosomal material and eventually you will have the loss of the integrity of the chromosomes and that can lead to cancer cell types. This is why human cells die. If you have immortal cell lines, usually it will be a cancerous cell line. Now, this is different in the case of the plant cells. Plant cells do not have this kind of um, infinite, uh, the limitation or hayflick limit. They have a growth which is unlimited. And so plant people like researchers are looking at plant cells in terms of the anti-aging properties okay so if you have immortal cell lines of course you will not age but if we if we do not age we will also have different diseases associated with the chromosomal aberrations now what is very unique about plant cells is that they will undergo a process known as somaclonal variation okay so that's how they probably uh, overcome this chromosomal degradation So in the cell cycle, we have the interface, the G1 and G2 phase, and then we have the S or the synthesis phase. So the mitotic phase is involved in mitosis and cytokinesis. Let's look at it. Now, I will focus specifically on plant cells. So in plant cells, we have cytokinesis, and you will see the formation, as I mentioned earlier, of a distinct cell plate. Now, in the case of the plant cells, the difference between these plant cells and animal cells is that the cell wall is composed of cellulose, lignin, pectin, and other proteins. So the plants will actually have to degrade the cell wall by using specific enzymatic procedures. And all of this is occurring continuously in the plant. So once there is a formation of the chromosomes and they are drawn towards the end, they are drawn towards the ends of the cell, then the next step will be the formation of this cell plate. And the cell plate will then form a distinct structure and then you'll have the formation of two cells. This is different from animal cells. So we'll focus primarily on the plant cells themselves. Okay, let's look at the process of mitosis. And mitosis, if I put, pull up this simple image, is begins with interface. 
And what it leads to is the formation of two daughter cells with a similar number of chromosomes. So it leads to the formation of diploid cells. Why is mitosis important? It's because it's undergoing. We are undergoing this process all the time. For example, you get a cut, your wound has to heal. The cells have to be induced to divide and they will form. They will form a scar, of course, but they will seal the cut on your skin. So this actually undergoes a phase known as prophase in which the chrom chromosomes will actually decondense. They will form. Then you will have a prometa phase. You will have a meta phase. So meta is the central phase because all the chromosomes move towards the center. Then you have the anaphase in which the chromosomes are pulled apart. The telophase in which they, the cellular process of division starts, cytokinesis, and then you'll have the formation of the diploid cells. So this is the overall process related to the cytokinesis in meiosis. Okay, let's look at the processes in detail. So first you have your prophase. So I will briefly draw it for you. So in prophase, you will have the cell. Okay, and then you'll have the first step, which is the formation of the disruption of the membrane here. So the nuclear membrane is opened up. At this stage, most of the cellular processes go into hiatus or in a pause to reduce the usage of energy. So th this particular membrane will disappear and then the chromosomes will be available for the next processes. So they will decondense here. Okay, moving on to the next phase is the pro meta phase. So now the chromosomes will continue to condense here. So you'll have the condensation of chromosomes and you'll have the kinetochores appearing here. So you'll have these two anchoring points and the chromosomes will be distributed here. Okay, so I will change the color to represent kinetochores. So you'll have these um, almost like a fiber here, which will pull them apart. So you'll have them being pulled in different directions. Okay, then you have your meta phase in which the chromosomes will actually be aligned as ready for the next phase, which is the division. So they'll all be aligned to the central plate, so they will be divided or pulled in opposite directions. Finally, you'll have the anaphase and telophase. So you'll have the chromosomes being separated. And you'll have the non kinetoco which will be the spindle fibers lengthening and el elongating the cell. So you can imagine this as a force which is pulling the cell apart. Okay. And this is the anchoring point. And these are actually pulling the chromosomes apart. So you have the sister chromatids breaking down. So you will we will describe that in detail in the next slides. Then you have the tello phase. Tello actually refers to the distant phase in which you'll have the reformation of the chromosomes. The chromosomes will be reforming in this material and then they will they will basically be separated during the process of cytokinesis. So this is the basic process in which you have your, your different phases of the mitotic division. And finally, during cytokinesis, you will have the formation of the cell wall and the restoration of the different Organelles, so you'll have the reformation. You'll see the endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria, and all dispense equally in the cell. Now, how all this occurs is very well documented. However, there's a lot of things which you need to still understand with regard to the process of how these organelles are divided within the cell. Now, in the case of meiosis, what happens is that each uh, cell will divide into four daughter cells. The process is similar. But the DNA replication, as usual, occurs during interphase. It's followed by two divisions. So you have uh, it's one and two, meiosis one and two, and one parent cell divides into four daughter cells. Each daughter cell contains one half of the chromosomes from the parent cell. There is genetic recombination, and this is very important with regard to meiosis. It's called homologous recombination, and this leads to variation. This is why, as you say, all the peas in the pod do not look similar, or you do not look similar to your siblings because there is a process of genetic recombination. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, this process undergoes two uh, cycles. So you have meiosis one, okay, and you have meiosis two, followed by 
cytokinesis. Okay. There may be some uh, interface here. We will discuss that in the next slide. So let's look at meiosis in detail. So this is meiosis one. So in the meiosis one, you will have chromosomal replication in the S phase. So that means you can see these chromosomes here. Okay, these are sister chromatid, which means that this chromosome in red is actually an exact replica of this chromosome. So the cell is actually having these uh, chromosomes and they are bound together by a protein known as cohesin. Okay. This cohesin is like a glue, it sticks them together. Now this cohesin is very interesting because as the cell divides, it will undergo a process of uh, becoming less sticky or unsticky. Okay, So this cohesin is a very interesting protein. So this, is, uh, this thing is known as a synaptomal complex and you have the syn synapsis and the chiasmata. So the chiasmata is actually the overlapping part of the chromosome. So you'll have overlapping parts between chromosomes. Okay, and because they are homologous, they can have the ability to cross over. Now, this is why we are interested in as breeders at the process of meiosis. Okay. Because during meiosis, something very interesting happens, which is the crossover of chromosomes. Okay, If you have chromosome A, I'll use two different colors. So I have chromosome A here. Okay, And then I have, I'm going to change my color to yellow. So we have chromosome. Okay, let's look at yellow. So we'll have two. Okay, we have these two chromosomes near each other. So what will happen is that you can have an event because of the similarity of the DNA sequences, a process known as homologous crossover occurs here. Okay. Now, this needs to occur at least one time in order for it to have recombination. But in the case of very large chromosomes, you may have this occurring more than one time. So it can go up to 25 times. So here I've shown you only one example, but this can occur throughout the homologous process of homologous recombination and you'll have multiple crossovers. So that's what happens during the process of genetic recombination. Now, when this occurs, you will have the distribution of the alleles because once it's distributed, when the cells divide from one to two and two to four, those distribution of the alleles will be occur based on the process of genetic recombination. And that's why it becomes relevant to us or important to us. Okay, now in the pro meta phase, you will have the centromeric region. The centromeric region is this is the centromere, and then you have the telomere, and these are the sister chromatids, and this is the kinetoco. So this is known as the mitotic spindle, in which you have the microtubules. Microtubules, you can uh, uh, give them uh, or visualize them as rope. So the rope is actually pulling the chromosomes apart. Now this process requires ATP. So that's how the the microtubule the machinery actually uses ATP to pull the chromosomes apart. So during metaphase one, you will have the formation of the first set of genetic arrangements. So you'll have these uh, chromosomes being drawn apart to the ends and then you'll have the cell division. And then during the metaphase two, you'll have the second uh, type of genetic rearrangement. So you'll have four daughter cells, which are the germline cells emerging from the somatic cell. Now, during anaphase, the microtubules will pull the chromosomes apart and the sister chromatids will be bound at the centromere, but the chiasmata or the overlapping elements will be broken apart. So both these sister chromatids will be pulled apart, but the overlapping elements will be separated. So this is what happens during pro meta phase one and then a phase one. So the microtubules will pull it apart. So you have what is first you have the gene duplication and then you have four, which is the tetrad. And after that, you will have the drawing apart. So you'll have each tetrad will then uh, be distributed into four cells. So you'll have one copy into each cell. And then you have the telophase. Telophase looks at distance. So you'll have a cell plate forming in plant cells and you'll have a division. So in meiosis two, the same thing occurs. However, there may be a process known as interface, which is a slight gap. So you have an interkinesis. Okay. Sometimes in some cells, you'll have interkinesis, sometimes not. If there is interkinesis and the uh, chromosomes will then condense, they will, be, uh, they will uh, maybe, they will have to basically not get duplicated and they will be transmitted into the next phase, which is the prophase two. 
So in prophase, again, you have the chromosomes getting decontents, and then the nuclear envelope, which is formed, it will be fragmented into vesicle. The centromeres will be duplicated, and new spindle will be formed for prometaphase two. So now the nuclear membrane is completely uh, destroyed or degraded, and each sister chromatid will then form a individual kinetoco, which will move on to opposite direction. Then you have metaphase two, which is basically metaphase one. Replica is the same thing, and then you have the anaphase two, and then of course the telophase. Now, what's happening during this process is that your sister chromatids are pulled apart by microtubules attached to the kinetochore, so they are pulled apart. Okay, and in prometaphase two, you have the attachment and then followed by pulling. So you can imagine this as a chromosome. You have your chromosomes. And then first you have the attachment of the microtubules here. And then you have your drawing apart. So you'll have the separation of the, chrom uh, the sister chromatids. Now, you'll ask me what happens to co coesin, the protein which is holding them together. During this process, the coesin will actually let go and they will be separated out. Okay, so this is the process of the meiosis and it leads to the formation of the germline cells. It explains why, for example, Mendel could, of, uh, could view or identify certain uh, phenotypes based on the recombination of the different kinds of morphologies of the peas. Now, in plants, there's a process known as alternation of generations, in which case the plants will undergo alternation from the diploid to the haploid generation. This is very prevalent in the moss for example you'll see the moss growing on the footpath you see so this actually undergoes a pro process of the alternation of generations in which you have one generation in which the genders are separate so you have the separation of generations and then you have the mating of those generations to create the diploid so they alternate between the diploid and the haploid state so there's a place there's a stage in which they are having dimorphism which means they are like us they have gender male and female but these are actually haploids. So they will undergo a haploid to diploid transition. So in the case of the diploid, of course, we are familiar with flowers. You will have distinct uh, formation of male and female flowers, or in some cases, male flowers and female flowers on different plants as well, dioecious plants. For example, papaya is a very good example of the male and female flowers. If you have a papaya with male flowers, you will not get any fruit. Okay, You may be familiar with this. In the case of, for example, tomato or chili, you'll have a single flower, you can self-pollinate. So this is a unique feature of the flowering plants and the angiosperms and gymnosperms. Now, with regard to the uh, ferns, okay, ferns, you have ferns, you'll look at the bottom of the leaf during the process of the sporulation, and you'll have the formation of spores. Now, these spores will be either male or female. They will again be... Uh, they will undergo a process of the formation of the zygote, and then you'll have the diploid phase, which is the full plant. Okay, so you have haploid and proto uh, and diploid phases in the plant life cycle. So this is related to the alternation of generations. So this brings us to the end of the lecture. So in today's lecture, we have focused on the process of cell division and the dispersion of genetic information or the replication of genetic material and the process of formation of the cell types using the process of cytokinesis, mitosis and meiosis. So mitosis leads to the formation of two daughter cells which are completely similar to the original somatic cell, whereas meiosis leads to the formation of the germline cells in which the genetic material moves or digresses from the diploid to the haploid state. Now, alternation of generations is a phenomenon which is unique to plants, in which case they undergo a process known as dimorphism, and they will have a different basis for existence in different stages of their life cycle. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the lecture. Thank you very much for watching.